Church, good to see you here tonight. Uh, hope you've had a good evening, and uh, we'll have some worship here. Um, I'm just going to hit some of the announcements we've had from this morning, and then see if we have any new ones. Uh, youth activity Saturday, October 8th, coming weekend. We also have the fall retreat, and again, if you didn't hear this morning, uh, if you don't have a camper, or you don't plan on staying the night, make sure you come in Sunday or Saturday and uh, hang out with us. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, kids active, uh, people catching up. Uh, it's a good time for all. Uh, November 12th, there's a hayride and hot dog roast. That's a little bit further out there, but we've got a lot of things going on. Um, this week, the men's prayer, prayer group is Thursday, October 6th. October 4th at 10.30 is the ladies' Bible class, and that's 10.30, 10.30 a.m. And this month is a mission month, so that last uh, contribution we have goes in its entirety to the missions. And I think we're getting really close to hitting the target already. Uh, we have a giving church, and that's really impressive. Uh, we know that there's economic challenges and still we have uh, some good things going on there. Uh, the food bank ministry is still in need. Uh, there's several items you can see on the bulletin. Uh, if you have a chance, uh, bring some of that stuff in. We're working out of two different rooms now uh, because it's expanded quite a bit. Boyd's coordinating that, doing a great job at it. Uh, the bridal pounding for Jordan and Elliot, uh, the new couple. Uh, you can bring some stuff there that you think they might need for starting a home. Uh, pretty exciting for them. We were there at the wedding, had all the kids. It was uh, interesting to say the, say the least, but we really did enjoy it, and it was a beautiful ceremony. Uh, we have some people that we want to have in our prayers. 
uh, Sergeant Joe Wells, uh, Edmund OKPD. Uh, one of the guys that Boyd knows, he got torn apart on his motorcycle. Uh, police officer uh, in, in his duty trying to protect people got hurt. Uh, and he's in really bad shape right now. Uh, Kelly Stevenson, that's Boyd's uh, daughter. Uh, she was in ICU for extreme dehydration. Uh, she's out of ICU, but she still needs prayers, still, still working on getting out of the hospital. Uh, Regina Barker had gone and had surgery to fix a, fibr a fibrillation, but uh, it's still there, so they're still looking at what they need to do. Uh, Adam House has had good news. I don't know about you, but that, that excites me. I've known Adam when he was a little bitty guy and he was hanging out around with us and uh, always intense, sharp guy, and uh, seeing that he's getting better is uh, encouraging to me. He still has some things ahead of him, but please keep praying for him. Uh, Reggie Deaton has been moved to hospice. That's a difficult situation. Um, we don't know what will happen, but uh, he's not in good good health, and we need to pray for him and especially his family. Are there, are there any other announcements we need to talk about? All right, I think we're good. Thanks. We're going to sing, we praise thee, O God, and then hallelujah, praise Jehovah. And then Daryl Belk's going to come up and lead us in our opening prayer. And I invite you to stand while we sing these two songs. And remain standing for the prayer. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of our love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Uh... 
and His glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Would you bow with me, please? Our most loving, kind Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you let us enjoy here on earth. Always let us remember that our greatest blessing of all is when you sent your son to earth to live the perfect life that we might have a pattern and to die for our sins that we may have a place in heaven with you. Father, we pray at this time for the sick that have been mentioned. We pray for Robert Fulmer. Father, keep the hands with the doctors that administer to him. Father, we pray that we'll, you'll give Roger a ready remembrance of what he's got to say tonight and us open our hearts to take it in and apply it to our everyday life. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Father, we don't want, uh, we don't want justice. If, it was, if we got justice, we'd have no chance. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and guide us in your life. In Christ's name. Please be seated. It's a little late, but that's okay. Number 15, step by step. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will sing, oh God, my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. And I will follow you all of my days, and I will follow you all of my days. And step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Song for the lesson number 19, Come Thou Almighty King. Come Thou Almighty King, help us thy name to see. Help us to praise, Father all glorious, for all victorious. Come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come now in incarnate word, good on the mighty soul. Spirit of holiness on us descend. O oh Lord our God, to Thee the highest praises be. It's evermore Thy sovereign majesty. May we in glory see, and to eternity love and Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I'm on. Glad to see all of you here this evening. It looks like we don't like one another tonight. We're scattered all over the place. But most importantly, I'm glad you're here. 
I used to, when I first started to preach, I used to fuss a lot about people sitting in the back of the building. Over the last 40 years, I've finally come to the conclusion I'm just glad they're inside the door. Uh, so uh, we're glad that you're here tonight, and we hope that your time here this evening will be well spent and that God will be glorified. We are continuing this evening in our series of lessons on David in the book of Psalms. We mentioned that there are 75 psalms that are specifically mentioned that David wrote in the psalm, and then there are two more that are credited to him in the New Testament. And so he wrote 77 of those psalms. We begin looking at those psalms. There are some of them that cover the same subject, and there are some subjects that keep coming up. There are some that, that, are, that we're going to look at. I mentioned when we first began, that Psalm 22 deserves a lesson of its own. Psalm 23 deserves a lesson of its own. There are some of these psalms we're going to be looking at individually. There are some of them that we're going to be looking at kind of grouped together based on subject. Tonight we're going to be looking at uh, what happens when disappointment and heartbreak come. I know the answer to this question before I ever ask it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Have you ever been disappointed? Have you ever faced heartbreak in your life? Have the two ever happened at the same time? In February or January of 1996, Sunday evening, <coughs> services were over. One of the elders walked up to me at a congregation where I was preaching and said, we need to talk to you in the office after church. And I said, okay. didn't think anything about it. I talked to them quite often. Walked in the office and sat down, four elders, one of them looked at me and said, and I'll never forget his words, he said, you're a really good preacher, you've really done a really good job here, but said, it's time for us to find somebody else. We're going to find a preach, another preacher just like you. And my response in, internally, although I, di I didn't say this externally, my response to myself was, if you want somebody just like me, why don't you just keep the original? <laughs> but I didn't say that. I, I was broadsided. That I didn't expect that. And it's probably one of the, if not the greatest disappointment I've ever faced in my life. I had been at that congregation almost 11 years. And my plans when I moved there were to never leave. By the way, my plans when I moved to Pleasant Valley were to never leave. <laughs> Everywhere I move, I plan on making it permanent. It doesn't always work out that way, but that's the way I plan it. Uh -huh. I didn't know that I moved there when Allison was in kindergarten. When we left, she was between her sophomore and junior year in high school. Can you imagine moving a kid 11 hours away when they're a junior in high school? All their friends, they've had friends for you know, 12 or 13 years. Everybody they know, been in the school system, been in part of the school system, been in the band, been in all these kind of things, and now we got to move to a place she's never heard of before. We ended up middle in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. And it's hard when you've only got two years left in high school to make any kind of... That was a great disappointment for me. I, uh, it took me a while to get over that one. But the reason I, I bring this stuff up is because life is going to have disappointments. Nobody gets through life without heartbreak. Nobody gets through life without somebody taking advantage of them or somebody using them, or somebody slandering them, or somebody uh, abusing them. The question is not if it's going to happen, but when. And the real question is, when it happens, what are we going to do about it? When you don't get the job that you want, when the promotion you tried for goes to somebody else, when the house that you wanted somebody else bought, when your children do things that are, that are uh, disappointing to you, when your spouse walks out the door and decides they're through with marriage, 
What do you do? How do you handle it? What's the answer? I want us to spend a few moments tonight looking at it. It's going to be primarily three psalms. Psalm 4, Psalm 55, and Psalm 56. We're going to get our major points from tonight, but I want us to, to think about some things that uh, David had to say about heartbreak and disappointment. If you think about David's life, you understand, David's life was spent, much of it, in the midst of heartbreak and disappointment. He spent the early years of his life running from Saul because Saul was trying to kill him. He spent uh, uh, a part of his life uh, living in contrary to God's word when he had the, the issue with Bathsheba. He then spent several months of his life running from his own son. He had his uh, greatest advisor turn on him. His son raped his daughter. He dealt with all kind of heartbreak. And so you look at what he wrote in the book of Psalms and you wonder, uh, what are some things we can learn from this? What are some lessons we can gain from what David said and did? And I want to begin in Psalm chapter 4, verse 2. David points out that we're going to be ridiculed and slandered. O oh, men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? When I read that verse, I think of Paul's dealings with Saul. David did everything that Saul asked him to. He was the, almost the perfect servant for Saul. And how did Saul repay him? Saul repaid him by accusing him of a treason. Saul repaid him by accusing him of being a criminal. And David spent several years of his life running from Saul, all because of Saul's mistreatment of him and because of Saul's false words and lies that he told about David. In Psalm 55, verse 21, he says, His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil but they were drawn swords. His speech was smooth as butter. You heard people talk like that? They sound so, so comforting and, and, and their words are just, they just flow out of their mouth. If you pay attention to what they're really saying, they're actually stabbing you in the back. And then he says... His words were softer than oil, but they were drawn swords. They were slandering, they were lying, they were accusing, they were mistreating with their words. And he goes on to say in that same chapter, Be gracious to me, O God, for a man tramples on me all day long. An attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long. For many attack me proudly. They won't quit. They keep it up. They're slandering me. They're lying about me. They're oppressing me. They're abusing me. And not only are they doing that, they're doing it continually. All the time. They just won't quit. He goes on in Psalm 55 to describe the condition that he was in as a result of this. And I want you to listen to this and see if you ever have felt this way. Begin in Psalm 55 verse 1. He says, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. Attend to me and answer me, for I am restless in my complaint, and I moan because of the noise of the enemy. Because of the oppression of the wicked. For they drop trouble upon me in anger. They bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me. And horror overwhelms me. And I say, oh, that I had wings like a dove. 
I would fly away and be at rest. Yea, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hurry to find a shelter from the raging wind and tempest. Have you ever had such heartbreak in your life that you just want to run? You just want to leave. You just want to go away and go somewhere else. You know the problem with that is? When you run away and leave, and go, the heartbreak goes with you. It doesn't stay put. David said, I, I'm in anguish. Almost feel like I'd be better off dead. I'm overwhelmed. I'm emotionally paralyzed. I'm scarred. I'm in trouble. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. I don't know how to, to answer. I have pain in my heart. I'm agitated. I find no rest. I'm paralyzed emotionally and physically. And I want to run. He didn't run. I don't know whether it's because he knew he wouldn't do any good or because he just wasn't offered a chance. The next point that David makes, and this one I think is, is vitally important for us to understand. <coughs> David's worst insult <coughs> did not come from his enemies. They came from his friends. Psalm 55, verse 12. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. There are two people I think of specifically in David's life that that could apply to. I think most probably in its strictest words, it probably applies to a man by the name of Ahithophel better than any other. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Ahithophel. I didn't for a long time. You remember when Absalom rebelled against David? There was a man in David's cabinet one of his advisors, whose name was Ahithophel. And the Bible says he was such a wise counselor, he was just a, such a smart man, that his word was considered to be God's words. He was just an amazing advisor and was, you might say, David's best friend, most trusted advisor, the one he turned to the most. And when Absalom rebelled against David, Ahithophel went with Absalom. Can you imagine how David felt? My own son is rebelling against me. But not only is my own son rebelling against me, the man who I trusted the most, the man who was my closest advisor, the man who is probably one of my best friends on the face of the earth, has turned his back on me. When you read that passage, I know what comes to my mind. When I read that passage, I don't think about Hithophel. I think about Judas. Because that passage is used in the New Testament to refer to Judas, who was an apostle of Jesus Christ, one of his 12 closest friends. He was Jesus' treasurer. He carried the money. There's no indication that Judas was treated any different than any of the other 11 or 12. But yet when push came to shove, he sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Can you imagine how that must have felt? Even though Jesus knew it was coming, it must have been horrible him to have to deal with. This man whom he had trusted, this man whom he had taught, this man who he had selected to be one of his uh, 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 people when he was gone. And yet he stabbed him in the back. He sold him for 30 pieces of silver. And while we're, while we're thinking about this, I want to I want to make one point that, that's not connected, but yet it is. I want to ask you a question. Which is worse? Betraying the Lord? Selling him? 
or denying you. I think they're kind of equal on scale, don't they? The reason I make that point is simply this. Judas is treated as a pariah. Peter is treated as one of the greatest apostles the Lord ever had. Why the difference? The sins are pretty equal. It's not the sin that made the difference. It's the response to the sin. Peter repented. Judas did not. You could say the same thing about the Apostle Paul. Was a co-conspirator in the death of Stephen. Probably committed hundreds, if not thousands, of Christians to prison. Yet he is held up today as one of the greatest servants of God. I've said on numerous occasions, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart, the greatest preacher ever walked the face of the earth, other than Jesus Christ himself, is Paul. Because he was willing to admit that he was wrong, and he repented. We need to remember that. Being willing to admit that you're wrong, that you've done something you shouldn't have done, is a sign of maturity and a sign of being a child of God, and it's vitally important if we're going to be God's people. Now, I want to spend the rest of this lesson talking about what do I do? When I face heartbreak and disappointment, when people fail me, when people stab me in the back, when people take advantage of me, when people abuse me, when life doesn't go how I want it to go, what do I do? I want to mention a couple of things. Number one, You pray for those who abuse you. Someone once said, this passage is the hardest passage in the Bible to follow. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. If God did not bless sinful people, where would you and I be? If God did not do good to people who were turning their back on him, where would you and I be? Because at one point in my life, I was rebelling against God. I was saying no to God because I was a sinner outside of of relationship with God. But God still cared enough for me. He loved me. He sent his son to die for me. And he offers me the opportunity of eternal salvation. Romans chapter 5 tells us Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. I didn't turn to God and then God said, okay, now I'll do something for you. God doing something for me is why I turn to God. If we're going to be like God, if we're going to be the sons of our Father, if we're going to be like Christ, we're going to have to do good to those who abuse us. And the most important thing we can do for them is to pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who abuse you. Pray for those who take advantage of you. Because if you only pray for people who treat you right, you're no different than the publican and the sinner. Because they do that. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be like God. We have a responsibility to pray for those who are our enemies. Number two, and I think probably most importantly, and maybe a little bit difficult, is to simply trust God. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. David said, I'm being persecuted and I cry out to God. Why did he cry out to God? He cried out to God for two reasons. Maybe three. 
Number one reason you cried out to God is because he's God. Who else are you going to cry out to? Who else are you going to turn to? Who else can handle these issues? Who else can handle these problems with God? Number two, he cried out to God because God had heard him before. I've had experience with this, he says. You, gave, you have given me relief. You listened to me before. And because you listened to me before, I know you will listen to me now. So he called to God because God had helped him before. And thirdly, he called to God because God promised that he would answer. God promises us as his people. He will hear and answer our prayer. Now the answer we need to understand may not be what we want. But I promise you the answer will be what you need. Because what I want and what I need are oftentimes two different things. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. What I wanted was to move to Marietta, Georgia. What I needed was to move to Van Buren, Arkansas. That's the difference. Sometimes, we've talked about this on several, sometimes God delivers you from the storm. Sometimes God delivers you through the storm. Because sometimes that's what you need. What's best for you eternally what's best for you in the long run, what's best for you over the years, and what's best for you in the next five minutes may be two different things. And we have to keep that in mind. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me, Psalm 55, verses 16 through 18. And a passage I've quoted probably as many times as maybe any other, Proverbs chapter 3, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and do not lean unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. If you look at verse 5, there are two, two phrases that are closely connected to one another. The first one, he says, trust in the Lord. Put your trust and your confidence and your faith in God because God will never fail you. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And then he says, and there's something connected to that. Lean not unto thine own understanding. What we want to do is we want to trust God when we can figure it out. When trusting God makes sense, when it adds up, when everything works the way we want it to work, then, well, well, God did what I wanted him to, so I can trust him. No. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Don't try to figure it out. There are some things in life that I'm not going to be able to figure out. I'm simply going to have to put it in God's hands and say, God, you know what's best. And, and you take care of it. Explain to me why well, my 34-year-old sister had to die from lupus. I can't explain it. Explain to me why I have an older brother who had buried two wives. I don't know. I can't explain it. I can't understand it. And if I spend all my time trying to figure all that stuff out, I'm going to be wallowing in self-pity and agony all my life because I'm never going. It's not going to make sense. It's not going to add up. And that's why Solomon said, "Trust God." And that brings me to my last point for tonight. If you trust God. And put your total faith and confidence in God. Here's what happens. Psalm 4 and verse 8. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. 
He had just been talking in the first part of Psalm 4 about the distress that he was in, about he was being abused and, and slandered and taken advantage of by those who are around him. And in the midst of all of this, he says, in peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you, O Lord, alone make me dwell in safety. May the, God, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Psalm 3 and verse 5, I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. While the enemy is surrounding me, while I am being overwhelmed, while my life is falling apart, I can lay down and sleep. Why? Because I know who's in control. My enemies may think they've got it, but they don't. Matthew, remember that passage in Psalm 23 where he says, in the presence of my enemies, you prepare a table before me. It's almost, almost like you get this, 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 this vision of David being surrounded by his enemies. While he's surrounded by his enemies, he's sitting down at a table and eating. How do you do that? Because I've placed this in God's hands. God's in control. God knows what's going to happen. And whatever happens is going to be what's best. It may not always be what I want. But it'll be God's will. The peace that passeth understanding. Psalm, uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. We have a relationship with a father who loves us, who provides for us, and who takes care of us in all ways and in all situations. And if we will simply lean on him, and depend on him, and trust in him, our life will be a whole lot better. Now, it doesn't mean all our problems are going to go away. It doesn't mean we're never going to be disappointed again. It doesn't mean we're never going to face heartbreak again. It doesn't mean my life is going to be a bed of roses. What it does mean, if I have God, I can survive anything. I can't endure it all. And I can come out on the other side. Because the other side is heaven. <coughs> it may not turn out great in this world. But if I have God, it'll turn out great in the next one. And none of us, when you really get that right, right down to it, none of us, I love this statement. I, I saw this on, in, in a bulletin somewhere. Nobody gets out of this world alive. All of us are going to die. And the older we get, the closer we're getting to it. I have a lot less time behind me than I have in front of me. I'm not going to live to be 135 years old. I'd like to, but it's not going to happen. And the closer I get to my final days on earth, the more I hope my trust and my faith grows in God. And whenever this life ends, and whenever all of this is over with, I can go home and be with my father. And all of this will have seemed like it was worth it. In peace, I will lie down and sleep because you alone make me dwell in safety. No matter what's going on around me, I am going to be okay because God is my father. I may not understand everything that happens in this life, and I know I don't. It may not all make sense. 
It may not all be what I think is good, but it will all work out for me in the end if I'm God's child. I hope that something we've said tonight has been of use and encouragement to you. I want to encourage all of us to think about our relationship with God, to, to, to examine ourselves and to see if we are trusting God like we should be. If that hasn't been the case in the past, you can start doing that today. Here tonight, you're not a Christian. You can't obey the gospel. Become a child of God. Have your sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb and begin that journey that leads to eternal life. If you're here and you've done that, you've walked away from your relationship with your Father, come back home. If you're subject to the invitation of the Lord in any way, we invite you to come while together we stand and while we sing. abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and closing prayer we're going to sing number 18 faithful love if you have not taken had an opportunity to take of lord's supper it's prepared to this room for you in my to my right if you can go there while we're singing this song you'll be served faithful love flowing down from the thorn covered ground makes me whole Saves my soul, washes water than snow. Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can stand on my own. Faithful love from Faithful love.
days of red, just when hope seems to end. Welcome face, sweet embrace, tender touch, filled with grace, faithful love, endless power, living flame, spirit's fire, burning bright in the night, guiding my way. Faithful love from above came to earth to show the Father's love, and I never be the same, for I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is his together. Almighty God and loving Father, we come before you now to ask your blessing upon us as we depart from this place, that we might be safe, that we might be strong in body and strong in our faith, strong enough to share it with those as we see opportunity. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.